we tried to do everything. And then right. we, we quickly realised that we were talking about a lot of stuff. Yeah. But we weren't actually making real inroads into the into any any of it. You weren't doing any of it well. No, it, right. just trying to spin all the plates. Yeah. So we sort of sort of took a, took a step back and said, okay, we we want to make a difference actually in some of these things, mm. and we've got to accept, you know, a bit like I was talking about the balance in my life. We can't make a di we can't do everything brilliantly. So let's prioritize. What are we really passionate about? And that's where the gentle farming came from. So that's our big initiative that we're now saying, right, we are. We are really behind this. We really want to make this work. We would love if every chocolate company said, that's how we're going to farm. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of CX Insider. Today, we speak to Lisa Hardy, the Chief Marketing Officer and Managing Director for Hotel Chocolat, the luxury British chocolatier. Lisa has unmatched industry leading experience, also being the non-executive director of Raven Property Group and the co-founder of her own probiotic skincare company, Beauty and Vitality. In this episode, we'll explore key topics including entrepreneurship, women in business, work-life balance and sustainability strategies. Enjoy the episode. And if you do, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel for access to the best content that CX Insider has to offer. By the way, this podcast is brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Cool. So hi, Lisa, and thank you very much for coming today. Um, we usually start by introduction, and today's recording is all about your story and how you became a high-performing individual and your experience at Hotel Chocolat. So would you like to start by telling us a bit about yourself and some of the career, or it doesn't have to be only career, but some of the turning points in your life that made you who you are today? Okay. So I'm Lisa, obviously. Um, I've got a number of roles in my life. So uh, I am UK MD for direct to consumer for Hotel Chocolat and group CMO. Uh, and that takes up most of my time. Um, I'm also a non-exec director for a business and I'm co-founder of a beauty business. Uh, but my most important role actually is I'm mum to four amazing kids and uh, wife to Chris. So that's a part of my life that's really important. And actually, it's my support crew that makes me successful in what I do in my work life. Um, I've had, you know, so many opportunities. I've been so lucky. Um, I've always had a mindset of you're here once, make the most of it. You know, how, 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 how wrong can things go? Give it a go. Um, and as long as how wrong it can go isn't catastrophic, then I'll, I'll definitely give it a go. So I've grabbed lots of opportunities in my, my life that have, fortunately come my way. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career working in the travel sector and that allowed me to travel a lot, see the world. And that was something I grew up in a small town. All my family lived in that town, literally like every street, there was someone from my family living in it. And I don't know why, I don't know where it came from. I just had a desire to see outside of that town and the world. So the travel sector really appealed. And uh, I traveled a lot, lived in other countries, worked in other countries, met some amazing people that are still great friends today, but learned tons, absolutely tons. Um, and then I moved into the telecom sector and I call those my Wild West days <laughs> because it was at the time when it was just mobile phones were just becoming a thing. I mean, the Apple iPhone hadn't even launched then. That's how old I am. But, um, you know, it was almost like you were you know, those massive things you used to carry yep. around with you, if you can remember that. Oh, yep. um, and it was it was just exploding everywhere. And it was innovation and technology. It was such great fun and really appealed to me. Um, and again, I learned a lot in that sector, but a very different set of things. I learned about brands. Um, I learned really about commercials and growth. Um, and that sort of fueled all of that experience, then fueled my next part of my career, which was retail. Um, and that's where I've spent the last 10-ish years. So for, re for me, retail is really, it brings all of that together. And it's about, retail is actually about people. It's about customers. It's about the people that work in your business. If you've got physical shops, you know, they are the epitome of your brand. And that's why I love Hotel Chocolat so much, because we have such amazing people. And you build a brand from the inside out. And that's what our brand is all about. And whenever I, um, you know, say to people, oh, I work at Hotel Chocolat, they you know, invariably would say, oh, your chocolate's amazing. <laughs> and then they'll very quickly follow that with your, your staff and your stores are incredible. And t tell me an anecdote about their local store or the local person that deals with them. Um, and that's what I love. But it brings together everything I've been doing in my career to this point, which is why I love it. Mm -hmm. 
You said that you've lived in different countries、yes. uh, in the past. What made you come back to the UK? Or I assume you grew up in England. I did.、Oh, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I grew up in England in the same town. My family still live there.、Um, I、uh, so I. It's a bit. It, it will sound a bit strange, but I got married, and then I moved to live in another country without my husband. Oh. So my my family, <laughs> my family thought I was slightly mad. Oh, but、really? your husband Chris probably thought you were a bit mad. <laughs> <laughs> well,、uh, yeah. I, my family just thought I was a bit odd.、Um, but it was one of those things. The opportunity came along.、Um, at that time, my husband was.、Um, Working on a role that was away a lot, so it kind of didn't really matter where、mm. I lived,、um, and I wanted to take the opportunity. So, but、um, after a couple of years, it was time to come home.、Um, I had my first child, and、um, that was really what prompted the move out of the travel sector into telecoms、mm. because I was traveling a lot, and、uh, it just wasn't going to be conducive with yeah, family life. So,、mm-hmm. are you busy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I always say everyone has the same twenty four hours in a day. So you know, people will often go, "Wow, you know, I'm so busy, 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 busy." It's it's kind of the word of our time, isn't it? How are you? Yeah, great, really busy. And it, it's I don't know. Sometimes you can wear it a bit like a status symbol. Oh, I'm successful because I'm really busy.、Um, but I, I, you know, I look at people and I go, you know, Barack Obama, he he just does twenty four hours in a day, right? Yeah. Bill Gates, he just has twenty four hours in a day. <laughs> so. And I think there's something about being a working mum that you become ruthless at prioritising and where you spend your time because you can't do it all. This whole notion, the '80s notion that I grew up with of women can have it all, nonsense. You really can't. <laughs> so you have to choose, and you know, business is about choices. Life is about choices, and so yeah, of course, I'm busy. I'd be busy if I wasn't working. To be honest, that's、yeah. just my nature.、Um, But I busy myself with the things that I choose and that matter. Clearly, Lisa has a lot of responsibility in her life, from parenting to work and high up roles in multiple businesses. How does she find the time to balance everything? Is there a secret to having it all? It's a constant, I guess you could say challenge, you could say opportunity, whichever you choose. But it, you know, it's constant. You never anyone that says to me they've just got it nailed, I'm really suspicious of. Maybe, maybe there are people out there that you know are incredible and have nailed it. I've been doing, you know, my eldest daughter's twenty four, so I've been juggling work and kids for twenty four years, and I've not definitely not nailed it. And I still have weeks where I get it wrong.、Um, but you know, I, I sleep at night because I do my best.、Um, I met someone last week actually, and they were like, "Oh my god, I've got one child and you've got four. How do you do that?" And I was like, "Well, you know, it depends where you want to. You can't be brilliant at everything." And it, you have to choose your levels. Yeah. And so for me, you know, are my kids breathing? Are they fed? That's success. <laughs> and anything beyond、yeah. that, great, happy days.、Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I think my kids are pretty balanced. I've got a great relationship with them.、Um, am I the person that is in the office till ten o'clock every night? No, because I have a family to go home to.、Um, but I think I, you know, I do what's required of me. I take my responsibilities seriously. Um, sometimes, you know, I have to put in those hours because there might be something happening that just needs attention. And sometimes I want to go to my kids' sports day, and and it, it's the yin and the yang. You know, it's the, that's the balance for me.、Mm-hmm. Do I go to every sports day? No, I've got four kids. I just can't do、no. that. Do I go to every single school concert? No, but I, I I think I choose well in terms of the ones that really matter and the ones that are really important. And I've got a good open dialogue with my kids. And I'll say, you know, is it really important that you want me to come to this one? Because if it is, I will do everything I can to to get there. And and I'm happy on those occasions to say at work, I can't do that meeting, guys, because this thing's really important, and I'm going to go and do it. And you know, I'm not doing that week in week out, so the balance kind of works.、Mm-hmm. I want to ask you: spend most of your career in the corporate world. What made you start your own? Beauty company, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So、um, when did she find the time? <laughs> Got to spare ten minutes. I, yeah, I don't. There, yeah. I don't sleep much. <laughs>、um, I think as a marketing person, you you always have that creative bit inside you, and it's funny whenever all the teams I've ever worked with, whatever business, you know, whenever you're kind of. You know, in the bar sometime, or on a kind of social thing, chatting about life, and you say to people, 
if you weren't in marketing, what would you do? You generally find people want to build something. Mm. So they either say, oh, I want to build a house or I want to be a chef or a landscape gardener. Typically is something that's got a bit of creativity and something quite tangible. And I think it's because marketing isn't that tangible as a career. You know, if you, if you don't work in marketing, I mean, my parents still think my job is to write PowerPoint slides. They, they just don't really understand <laughs> what I do. Yeah. Um, so I think I've always had that kind of desire to create something. And um, it was actually when I was at Holland and Barrett and we saw an emerging trend in the beauty sector. We had a few beauty products that were naturally, you know, as a national, national health retailer that were natural products, no nasty ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, and we started to see that sector really grow. And obviously, you know, Anita Roddick Body Shop was you know, infamous for her campaigning around, um, you know, what you put on your skin. And we really started to get into that space and we started to get a lot more customers come into the brand because of that. I got really curious about it and, and interested in it and started to look at the science and um, could see that pre and probiotics, the research was really showing this massive benefit between gut health and actually your overall health, but mm. particularly skin health and brain health. And so I was like, okay, but why isn't anyone in the skincare world got putting prebiotics in their moisturizers then and, and their supplements and putting it together? Because there was still quite a divide between people that buy supplements and people that buy skincare. Um, and that was where the idea started. Um, but that was six years ago. So it's taken me a while. Okay. Um, but, you know, finding, I worked with a nutritionist to develop the product um, and the formulation for the product. I wanted to focus specifically on um, menopausal skin because there's not much out there. And um, over over time, lockdown didn't help, if I'm honest, but over time, got the product developed and built, started to build the idea behind the business, um, bought, a, bought some business partners on board, um, and together we've sort of created something that's now become real. Nowadays, the pressure that social media places on people to look, feel, and live their best is causing increased levels of depression and anxiety. Often the content you see online is a twisted skew of reality, which empowers these destructive effects without users even realizing. This has also seeped into the corporate world through the over-glorification of achievement, leading many to think they are behind or failing. How does Lisa approach this problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I call it I call it the, uh, the Instagram effect. So, and I think it goes, you know, it's, it's kind of permeated society much more broadly than just social media, but it starts with social media, which is everyone's portraying their best self, right? Um, and that's not new to social media. I mean, for years, people talk about the mask, you know, you go to work, you've got your corporate mask yeah. on. Um, so people always want to show their best side. Of course they do. But I think the proliferation of social media has made it such, you know, a bit like, you know, in the 80s when I was growing up, women can have it all. Um, this perfect example of what life should be like sets people's expectations. And that's not fair because it isn't like that. And, you know, I was I was celebrating a few years ago when there was a few Instagram influencers in the States that came out and said, this isn't real, people. <laughs> you know, that image you saw, saw of me that was a casual shot on the beach actually took us four hours to yeah. set up. I didn't eat for two days before, you know. I'm holding my stomach in. Exa exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was really applauding that because I thought, you know, it, finally somebody's kind of breaking through and saying, this is not real. It, it's a facade. Mm. Um, and that comes through into life as well, I think, now. So, um you know, I was doing a talk at a women's lunch a few weeks back and I talked about, um, I was talking about my career and I was giving some examples of, you know, working mum, how, you know, what, how challenging that can be. And particularly, you know, now I'm in a fortunate position that I don't have a boss that's kind of saying, you know, got to be here at nine, got to leave at five. At all, no, yeah. I can come and go kind of as I, as I need to. Um, but, you know, in the younger days, I was expected to be in meetings mm. and, you know, as a junior person, I couldn't just go, mm. oh, sorry, I'm not coming in for that. Um, and that's that's hard. And I was trying to kind of get that across to the audience and say, I, I get it because I've been, you know, I've been there. Yeah. Um, and I told a story about, um, I told two stories, one about uh, being in a meeting and realizing I've got Weetabix 
all down my top because nice. I've been feeding my daughter in the morning. Okay. <laughs> and if you've ever, ever fed a child Weetabix, it has this amazing ability. You wipe it off and it comes back. Yeah. And it's, and it, yeah, and he can't get it off. No. It spreads. It yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Just, and you think it's gone and then it comes back. Um, and it looks a bit like sick. It's not nice because people don't know what it is. And they're <laughs> yeah. like, what is that? So that was one story. And then the other story was I'd done a board presentation to the board. And I thought I came out thinking I nailed that. I actually nailed it. And I was really anxious about it. Mm. And I'd been in this board meeting, you know, gesticulating and show, pointing to things. And I realised when I came out that I'd got a Heinz baby food label stuck to the underside of they my sleeve. They would have remembered the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I told it as a funny story, but sure. at the end, loads of the women came up to me and, and they said, oh, you are so normal. <laughs> and I was like, well, what did you think I was going to be? Yeah. But they said, people don't. People don't tell those stories. They talk about all their successes and all their achievements and they don't talk about the stuff that went wrong. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't a disaster, but, you know, you have to laugh about these things. Yeah. We're all human, right? 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Lisa has touched on the notion that women can have it all, that it's possible to juggle a successful career, a social life, hobbies, a family, and anything else you can dream of attaining. Speaking from experience, however, Lisa suggests that this can be an unrealistic and misleading goal and that compromise between choices is key for everyone. Yeah, and it is an interesting phrase because I certainly don't want people to take out that I mean you can't have it all. Um, because I think you can have everything you want to have. Um, and I certainly have it all in terms of the things I would want in my life. I guess where I, I don't like that phrase is particularly when I, I was kind of in my early 20s, there was a, a lot, that phrase was used a lot and, and it was a bit of a pastiche for, um, you know, you can have a career, you can have a family, you can look amazing and be size eight, you can be super fit and run marathons on the weekend, you can have a perfectly clean house that you're doing yourself, um, you're feeding your family hand-cooked meals that are nutritionally balanced. Wow. Um, and I think there was just such a lot of pressure that you had to be doing all those things and perfect at all those things. And I think that's the bit for me that Instagram is replicating. Mm. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a bit of an interior design nerd. I love looking at, well, I'm just nosy really. So I like looking at house accounts on yeah. Instagram. No problem love with that. It. I do the same. And they all, you know, they all look perfect and beautiful and showroom like, and then occasionally you'll get someone and go, this is what it looks like when the kids get home from school. Yeah. And I'm like, hallelujah, yay, my house Shoes looks like that Shoes everywhere, clutter all the magazines out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think for me, and, and a lot of people ask me and say, especially if they're going to go on maternity leave, you know, what, what should I do? Should I take a year off? Should I give up work? Should I come back part time? Should I come back full time? And I would say, you have to choose what's right for you. Um, so for me, I chose to work full time. So I had my maternity leaves and then went back to work okay. full time. And that was right for me, but that's not right for everybody. For some people, it may well be taking a few years out or maybe never going back to work. Um, only you can know what is right. Can I ask a question on that? And this mm. could be really controversial, but it's just come to my mind. I've always thought this and I'd be interested to get your view on it. Do you think women are at a disadvantage? Because let's say you're, you're obviously a career woman. You, you, be, you are successful, being successful. If you suddenly decided, and you say, let's say you're 24 years old, you want to have a family, you just said you've got to have time out. You have to because ultimately you are bearing a child. Yeah. Do you think that puts a woman at a disadvantage? Because even if she decides to go back to work full time, she still has to have an element of time off. And do you think that has a negative effect on that lady's career path. Now, I know that's a really controversial question, but it's just, in my opinion, I think it does. I think it's actually a almost like an Achilles heel because you can't change that. But it'd be interesting to get your point of view. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and, you know, it never occurred to me until I was talking with a colleague one day um, who didn't have children. Mm. And we, we both effectively, we were peers. We did the same level of job. Okay. And she said, she said to me, well, you're so much more successful than me. And I mm. said, well... What do you mean? How, what did we do the same job? What are you on about? Right, yeah. And she said, yeah, but you've, you've taken four years off because of maternity leave. So I'm four years ahead of you and we're doing the same job. So right. you must be more successful than me. And I never really thought about it before. Mm. And I, I just thought, yeah, it does that, is that perception that because I've taken four years off, they're almost four missing years. Yeah. 
I think a lot of it comes back to how women treat their maternity leaves. And this is part of what I always talk to people about when they, when they ask me is you need to think about how you want your maternity leave to be because it's not one size fits all. Mm. So for some people, they want to be 100% focused on their children and not hear from work mm. until they're ready to go back in. And that's fine. But for other people, and I was one of these, I knew I wanted to go back in full time. I didn't want to feel like I'd, I'd missed a lot or was out of touch with what was going on okay. in the business. So I had an agreement with the people I was working for as to how I wanted to keep in touch. So I wanted to, you know, if there were big kind of away days, I'd, I wanted to be invited. Mm. I may choose not to go, but I wanted to have the option to mm. go in and be connected. Um, once a quarter, I would meet my boss for dinner just, oh, to, wow. just to catch up on what's going on what's the news what's the gossip so though you weren't there mentally you yes definitely I were. was checking in I wasn't yeah. there all the time I definitely wasn't there all the time but I was be, checking yeah. in sure um and that meant that when I did go back into the business I felt like I was still connected mm. um and I didn't I didn't spend the first six months thinking oh my you know what's, what's, going, what's on? going on this has all changed yeah. 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 yeah yeah um now that's not for everyone mm. but I think sometimes um and this might seem sexist but it's not meant that way but sometimes male bosses don't quite know how to approach that conversation mm -hmm. um and so they think because it's a difficult subject just keep away just from don't it talk about and it. then that doesn't help because then as a, a person on maternity leave you either never hear from your boss and then you get really suspicious and think what's going on they're getting rid of me yeah. i'm gonna be replaced yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah um or you hear from them too much and you're like leave me alone <laughs> So I, I always encourage women to be proactive on that and say, get in the driving seat. Think Take some about, control. Yeah, to, to think about the kind of maternity leave you want and talk to your boss about it because mm. they probably just don't know how to broach it with you. No. Mm -hmm. um, do I think it's a disadvantage? I think it depends on the organisation you work for. Okay. So I'm really lucky. I work in a very forward-thinking organisation. We have lots of women that work part-time. Um, we've got a young female-oriented workforce, so lots of people on maternity leave. Lots of senior female women. Mm -hmm. um, so in our organisation, no, I don't think it does. Brilliant. But I've worked in organisations that are not like that. And I think then in those cases, sadly, yes, it can. I've got one more question. Because I think that a lot of, me a lot of women uh, talk about this actually going back from maternity leave back to business. It must be super stressful period. How? What advice would you give? So I would, uh, my advice would be try and ease in gently. You know, just, you know, having a, a Friday where you might probably the week before just be getting your child into a nursery perhaps. Um, so you've got a lot of stress around that because that's a change. And then on Monday morning, you're back in the office. So you're giving yourself a pretty short runway to yeah. go through a lot of change. Mm -hmm. So I always advise people to kind of try and think about that, think of it as a transition because it's a major transition. Mm. Uh, and, and I had one of my maternity leaves I had cut short because something had happened at work and they needed me to step into a role and it was a bit of a crisis situation. Now, I wasn't forced to, I agreed to do that, mm -hmm. but still, suddenly I'd got a shorter maternity leave than I thought I had. So I did have to do that quite rapidly. So I, you know, my advice is always think about the timing, think about the transition and be a bit kind to yourself and yeah. try and ease that in gently. You know, maybe you could, you've got an option that you could do um, nursery for one day a week or an afternoon a week in the, in the build up to it. Because that can be a mental adjustment as well when your child goes to nursery or a childminder for the first time. You know, there's keeping in touch days where you get paid to work during your maternity leave. Okay. So, you know, use, I think you get 10, certainly in my day you used, yeah, yeah. used to get 10. It might be more now, I don't know. But, um, you know, think about how you don't have to use all 10, but could you use some of those mm -hmm. in the run up just to go back into the office environment and have a couple with people just get a bit used to the commute again. Um, you know, your get get some time with your boss to kind of mm. go. How's the business moved on in this time? Um, how's the how's the shape of the department changed? Because you know, sometimes that that's can a really good point. Because I think if you're not if you're not engaged with what you're about to step into, you could almost be anxious about it, couldn't you? Yeah. You, yeah. Anxiety levels could go through the roof because yeah. you've obviously got a new child going into nursery or whatever it is. You're probably yeah. anxious about that. You then got the fear of, oh my God, I'm going back to work on Monday. I haven't got a clue what I'm going into, what's in store. So yeah, very good. Yeah. Good and I think, you know, business is so fast moving. Mm. If you're taking a year for maternity leave, a lot can change in a year. Just a bit. And, it, you know, it could even be things like technology. 
you know, I know people that have worked in e-commerce where the website replatformed to a different platform <laughs> in the time they're on maternity leave and suddenly they're coming back and they don't know that platform. Three years ago, we weren't all using Teams and Zoom. Yeah, yeah is that exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can remember my first yeah. Teams calls. Yeah. yeah, and now it's just so, second nature. Yeah, use that time to kind of build your confidence um, and, and support network. Can't, you, you know, okay. you can never have a big enough support network. You're definitely a fan of people. Yes. 100%. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I didn't do this on my own. No, sounds, absolutely yeah. not. Bringing all these insights together and applying them to the corporate world, does Lisa have any advice for entrepreneurs trying to stay dedicated and motivated to accomplishing their goals? I'll come back to support network, mm -hmm. definitely, because we're not all brilliant at everything. Um, well, I don't think so anyway. You know, be, be self-aware, think about what your strengths are, think about your passion, your purpose, um, and really excel at those. I've never really been a fan of the advice, look at your weaknesses and try and improve them. Yeah. If they're your weaknesses, they're your weaknesses, just accept it's it. Like, it's like at school. Like yeah. they, they don't identify their kids good at art, but they cannot speak French, have no interest in speaking French. Let them have extra art lessons and yeah. cut out the French. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm totally with you. Play yeah. to your strengths. And then find a support network and do the bit that you're not so good at. So mm. I always try and do that when I'm building teams is get people that are really exceptional at the things that I know I'm not great at. Sure. Because it doesn't matter. I could spend all my time doing those things. I'm still not going to be great. I might be better at it, but I'm not going to be mm. great at it. And yeah. I, want, I want a team that's going to be great at everything. So in terms of motivation, absolutely think about what you're passionate about. Think about what you're good at because that's human nature. That's where you're, that's going to be your North Star. Mm. And then in terms of getting things off the ground, think about the support network. So think about who else can complement your team. Who, you know, it's we, right? Nobody does anything on their own. No. So who, who can help? Who can get you there? Who's going to be your, you know, support? You know, my husband, I've had a bad day. I walk in the door. He's got a glass of wine literally waiting for me. Like so a I legend. Walk in. He is a legend. <laughs> um, you know, I could not be, I could not do what I do without him being in my support network. Right. Um, I've also got people, though, that I know will be critical. When I need somebody to give me some honest feedback, I know who to talk to on that. Okay. And I know they'll be honest. So it's, it's really about kind of being quite scientific about that and, and and how you're going to build that and then that lets you do what you're good at and what you enjoy we spoke about people we spoke about support network and a hotel chocolate sounds like it's incredibly important to people and you're right in retail it's about people they're the, you've got a store that's who people remember isn't it customers remember those people how do you recruit for that because i also spent 10 years in retail and i was a branch manager and all that kind of stuff and i remember at the time it was the recruitment process was pretty awful to be honest it was like oh can they work weekends and that was it <laughs> yeah what do they look like can they work weekends can they use a till almost but that doesn't necessarily create a great customer experience what do you guys do is there any kind of secret to that that we should all be thinking about or have i gone too rogue <laughs> no 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 it's a, it's a really good question because okay. it is a chat it's a challenge that retailers really grapple with mm. and i think you know various retailers have tried different things to various degrees of success so I think Pret's probably the most famous one where mm. they get people to actually work in the store and then the colleagues decide whether they get a job or not. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Which I think is brilliant, that right? That's amazing, yeah. Because you all know you only need one person that doesn't quite fit and the whole energy of like that Like a poison store. pill almost, yeah. just like brings it all down. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. So they, they actually kind of shortlist people. Clearly there's competency interviews and of things. Course, yeah. But then when they've got their shortlist, they go and work in the store. And then the colleagues go, yeah, we want to hire him or right. we don't we want him on the team. Shift. Some, yeah. yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I didn't mm -hmm. even know that existed. And actually, I picked this up from a retailer I was working with in Holland, in the Netherlands. Um, think about the store as your house, okay. your home. So when someone steps over the threshold of the, the, the shop front, they're coming into your home. Mm. You know, would you ignore someone coming into your home? Of course you wouldn't. You'd go and greet them and say hello. Mm. Um, you'd want to make them feel comfortable. Mm. And and for me, that's what you want in a store environment. And that's what I look for when I'm recruiting people is who, yeah. who brings that humanness. That energy. Yeah. Right. And that energy. Wow. Okay. Sorry, that was a rogue question. No. <laughs> and I know we want to talk about sustainability. But, but, <laughs> but Lisa's got loads of knowledge. And I worked in retail for a long time. So I'm just, in, I'm really intrigued. Moving on to Hotel Chocolat the British cocoa brand that places people at the heart of everything they do, including their exceptional sustainability programme. Let's find out what sets them apart in this field of ethical business. I mean, interestingly, when Angus, our co-founder, set the business up, mm. 
one of the core values right from day one was ethics. Okay. And that, you know, this is a long time ago. So way before it was kind of popular or trendy or necessary. He was ahead of the today. game. He was ahead of the game. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the business has always been run with ethics at the core. Um, which I think is 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 great. It's amazing mm. because we're not we're not trying to adapt to something external that's coming at us. Mm. It's in our DNA, absolutely okay. in our DNA. And the the mission of our business is about um, making people happy through chocolate. That's that's why we get out of bed in the morning. I mean, well, apparently know, releases endorphins. It does. It's re it's really good for you. Yeah, it's really good for you. <laughs> but 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 we look at it from a broader sense, not just not just from eating it. Mm. But everybody in the industry of chocolate, let's make them happy. So the people that work for us, the people that grow the cocoa, the people that supply it. Mm. So cacao, I think, you know, cacao, which is the raw ingredient of, of chocolate, is is precious. Yeah. And I don't know that everybody realizes that because, you know, when you're sat in a petrol station shoveling down a Kit Kat. Um, which it's is a timeless <laughs> chocolate bar, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a classic we don't appreciate the preciousness of what goes into making no. chocolate and when you've been to a cocoa farm and you walk around and, and we've got a, a farm in St Lucia where okay. we grow our own cocoa not all of our cocoa comes from there but we grow our own there and we've also got a visitor attraction that we give people tours so they see how the cocoa is grown what it looks like on a tree in a pod how you open the pod what it because it looks nothing like you would imagine okay and i I've, I've done those tours with people and and you see the realization of when they realize how much goes into growing cocoa mm. and and farming cocoa and how much cocoa you need to actually make a bar of chocolate what have a clue yeah quite a lot i bet yeah so and and it just it, it just gives people a different perception that when you're in a supermarket and you're buying a bar of chocolate for you know 75p or a pound mm -hmm. or whatever it might be that actually it's pre it's quite precious okay. and so for us there, there's a there's a piece around um we want to make everybody in that that chain happy and so we started a program because we've got our own farm mm. we started a, a program to look at how how we can contribute more in the cocoa industry and how we can change the cocoa industry so historically um, in some regions of the world where cocoa is grown, it's caused deforestation okay. um, because there was a belief that you needed to just plant loads of cocoa plants, get loads of sun on them. Um, and that's the way to get the most yield from your plant, the most cocoa pods. And that's how typically farmers get paid is however much they produce mm -hmm. is, is relevant to how much they get paid. We've demonstrated through what we've done on our own farms that um, by what we call gentle farming, um, you can improve yields over time and be much kinder to the planet uh, and not have to cut trees down. You can actually plant trees and grow oh. cocoa in the shade, which is much okay. better, much yeah. better for the planet. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the trick, though, the challenge is initially your yield isn't quite as good. It takes two or three years for the yield of that, um, that crop to catch up. Right. So we realized this was going to be a problem because when you bring in new cocoa farmers they just want to earn as much yeah. straight away right not you can't say well honestly trust us in three years it'll be fine mm. um so we uh one of our biggest regions for cocoa is ghana okay and so um angus our ceo and a team went out to ghana um to talk to the farmers and basically what we've done is we've put a payment in place that pays them an additional amount in those first couple of years that they need to sort of trust us and Wow. and and plant in the shade and um accept the yield may not be quite there so we would pay them what they would have earned anyway and then by the time it sort of catches up it then gets into its own that's amazing and it's a much better way of farming yeah to... you're not putting profits as the first thing really I, and maybe obviously it must be a profitable organization but you're actually taking a negative there aren't you you're taking money off the PL to support someone yeah i mean we yeah and it was you know it's the commercial person that yes. has to earn the money um, it was, you know, it wasn't an insignificant amount sure that, was, uh, yeah. that was taken, but it, it was the, it's the right thing to do. Okay. And as an ethical business and, you know, we want, we want cacao to be sustainable, right? Mm. We, we all want to be eating chocolate forever. Yes, I do anyway. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, we've got to, we've got to make some shifts. We've got to, just as we have with all of the environmental issues that mm. we're grappling with, right? We've got to, we've got to change. We can't yeah, just carry on as we are and expect that. It's just going to be all right. 
No, definitely not. That actually kind of leads me to my next question. So sustainability transformation is a big thing at the moment with all organizations. And you've mentioned something there that you have done from day one almost. But for external organizations that they're all of a sudden thinking we need to do this or we have to do this, how do they focus their energies? What do they focus on? Yeah, that's such a good question because it's really hard. I bet. You know, it's almost like we've just suddenly woken up and mm. now there's a million things we've got to fix all mm. at once. Um, and small, you know, we're not a big business, certainly in the world of cocoa. We're, okay. we're a pretty small business, really. Um, and we can't do everything. I always say um, our ambition is greater than our reality. Okay. We want to fix everything right now, but we just can't. We have to make choices. So gentle farming for us was a really important choice um, and, and an area that we felt we'd got some expertise in and we could really get behind and we're really passionate about. But there's a million other things that we want to do as well. Mm. So what we've tried to do is to sort of is almost sequence things. So we've uh, uh, and to be fair, we've done that because I think we got it a bit wrong in the beginning. Okay. We tried to do everything. And then like. we, we quickly realized that we were talking about a lot of stuff. Yeah. But we weren't actually making real inroads into the into any any of it. You weren't doing any of it well. No. It, right. Just trying to spin all the plates. Yeah. So we sort of sort of took a took a step back and said, okay, we, we want to make a difference actually in some of these things. Mm. And we've got to accept, you know, a bit like I was talking about the balance in my life. We can't make a di- we can't do everything brilliantly. So Let's prioritize. What are we really passionate about? And that's where the gentle farming came from. So that's our big initiative that we're now saying, right, we are we are really behind this. We really want to make this work. Yeah. We would love if every chocolate company said that's how we're going to farm cocoa. Yeah. But we've also got legal requirements as a as I'm a sure. listed business. So we have somebody that sort of sort of manages our right. Here's all the things that we have to do, and we have to make sure we're keeping up with legislation, and that we're kind of treating that almost as day job. Um, and then here's some other things that we want to do. Um, so we want to make sure all of our packaging is recyclable and we've made some headway into that, but we're just trying to sequence it all and make choices. And then there'll be other things that we think that's important. That'll be next on the list, but we're not going to, we're not going to put energy that right now. We're going to get this bit first. Yeah. Makes sense. That would be my advice. That's pretty self too thin basically. No. Yeah. Yeah. Try and sequence it. Make a difference. Many companies are accused of misleading their customers by advertising their ethical and sustainable virtues, yet behind the scenes, their business is anything but. This can be a true issue for brands who actually are trying to make a change. So how can this dreaded greenwashing be avoided, while still representing real sustainable practices? 30 years ago, I worked in a business called the Business Environment Association. Okay. And it was about trying to encourage businesses to have be more environmentally responsible. So this is part of my DNA as well. I've you know been working in, on environmental stuff for a long time. And I got asked exactly the same question. 30 years ago? Exactly the same question. Okay. So 30 years ago, it was happening then. Okay. I think it's more prolific now. Mm. And I, I, I think a lot of it, in all honesty, is not deliberate. Mm. I don't think businesses are trying to falsely claim, but it's a complex area. And, you know, with marketing, there's many layers to marketing. Marketers are ultimately storytellers. And I think that's where the environmental stuff sits, because you've got to tell the whole story. Mm. You know, I took quite a long time to answer your question about gentle farming, because I can't answer that in a sentence. No. I have to explain it. Yeah, of course. But, you know, we marketers will also have to put things in shop windows or posters that have got a headline. Yeah. How do you encapsulate it into a headline? And I, th- I think, I like to believe that's where some of the misleading stuff comes from. It's because we're trying to shorthand the message. And you can't do it. To get customers' attention. And you can't. You've got to tell yeah. the story. You see a lot of stats, don't you? At the moment, it's all about stats. Yeah. Yeah. And then people obviously investigate those. Oh, that, that yeah. Makes sense. Although, what's the famous statement? Lies, lies and statistics. <laughs> yep, there you go. <laughs> you, can get, you can get stats to say anything, right? You can. You so, can. You can frame it in whatever way you want. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And again, that's where the story becomes important because you're giving mm. it the co- the statistic, the context, mm. the real context, the true story. And I think the thing, the important thing that marketers need to be responsible about is this is a journey. So it's not one dimensional. Mm. And so none of us are perfect. No one's nailed it. No. So be honest about that. You know, we are, we would love to say, oh, all of our packaging is recyclable. Um, it's not right now. 
yeah. we've done a massive improvement job mm. to get it to where it is um and how do you define recyclable because there's no national standard for curbside recycling in this country oh i went on holiday to suffolk did you know that no, but I know that like recycling is tricky in the UK. Like you go yeah. to Switzerland and you can recycle literally every single, every different color of glass. Yeah. And wow. here everything is mixed and just dumped together. Yeah. 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 So I went to Suffolk on holiday and rented a holiday home. And at the end of the week, got my wine bottles from mm -hmm. the week and thought, right, which bin do I put these in? There's no curbside recycling of glass in Suffolk. Just in Suffolk? No. Oh, weird. You have to, you can recycle it, but you've got to drive mm. to a recycling point and put your glass in. They don't collect it. And people aren't going to do that. I just assumed every, everywhere in the country, yeah, you I put would. your wine bottles out and someone picks them up, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 100%. But that's a, that's a really good example. You put them in your blue bin. Yeah. yeah. My parents live in Buckinghamshire, which is the next county to where I live. Mm. They put everything into one bag and it gets taken away and sorted. Okay. Okay. I have to sort everything into bin, different. See, I'm in Surrey. We stick it in a big blue bin. Yeah, there you Whether go. Whether it's cardboard, glass, Th whatever. There's no standard. So that means when people say we're 100% recyclable, recyclable where? Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode, learnt something new or had your brain cogs turning. If you want to join a growing community of thought leaders, head over to our LinkedIn and follow us at CX Insider Podcast to stay updated. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for access to full length videos like this one, shorter clips for lighter viewing and also YouTube shorts for our best moments. Thanks again, and I'll see you in two weeks. But for now, enjoy our rapid fire questions. By the way, this podcast has been brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Have you got your quick fire round questions? I have. Oh, I've got you know, a am question, I ready? which I don't even think it's on there. <laughs> you have, no, you don't. I haven't got any, but I was going to ask, I where have... does the name come from? Hotel Chocolat? Yeah. So Angus, our founder, um, wanted something that really evoked an emotion. Okay. And... To him and to many people, chocolate gives you that moment of escapism. Okay. You know, you all know when you've had that day, that day and you just have a bite of chocolate and you shut your eyes and just go, oh, it's all good. Life mm. is good. And so that moment of escapism was where he started and that's where he landed at Hotel Chocolat. Because it is a place to escape to. It's a place to escape to. He's a clever man, is that? He's a very clever man. <laughs> Isn't he? Yeah. Do I? Is it me? But I have a feeling that all of a sudden when you said chocolate gives you a feeling of escapism, like it's all of a sudden it became cloudy and like <laughs> there was like more shadow <laughs> and more light here, like <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, let's, let's, let's go in fire. quick fire ones. <laughs> Okie dokie. So what's some of the best business advice you've ever gotten? Oh, that's a good question. Um, always focus on the customer. Always put the customer first. And if you're struggling with knowing what to do next, start with the customer and the answer is usually there. Mm -hmm. What's uh, your favorite part about uh, working at Hotel Chocolat? The people, the people and the culture. It's an amazing business. I mean, we're working in chocolate, right? So yeah. that Good helps. Start. That definitely helps. Yeah. But it, I, I, I say this to everyone. It's just the nicest bunch of people I've ever worked with. What is the one thing you're deeply grateful for right now? I really work to be grateful for lots of things in my life. I'm incredibly lucky. I've been incredibly fortunate. Right now, I think my children, my children are at that age where they're getting older um, and I can remember being that age mm -hmm. and they still want to sit around the dinner table. They still want to share stories about their day what's going on in their lives and they are eternally hopeful for the future. Both my two older children, both are very focused on changing the world. And wow. that makes me hugely grateful. If you were a superhero, what would you do first? Oh, I'd have two things in quick succession. Am I allowed to have two? Yeah. I would, I would fix hunger um, and make sure there was nobody hungry. And I would give everyone a support network, even if it's just one person. That would be a pretty good superhero, to be fair. Why don't Marvel do movies and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> I was, can I ask a random question? Mm. I've just thought of it in my head. Okay, you're at the petrol station. You're craving a chocolate. Now, I know you don't often sell chocolate at the petrol <laughs> station. What's your go-to chocolate bar? 
Oh. If it wasn't one of your own, of course, because you can't get one of your own because it's not in a petrol station. You have to get something else. Okay. Um, gosh, this is like. Saying, and we don't have to leave it in there if it gets you in my, trouble. My favourite footballer on another team. Um, it would be Galaxy. Galaxy. Okay. Sorry, that was a very naughty question. I'd be double decker. What would you be? You eat chocolate, right? Kinder Bueno. <gasps> oh, good choice. Yeah, that is a good shout. The white one. <laughs> See, I can't, I really don't like white chocolate apart from our white chocolate. Does yours white chocolate actually contain chocolate? No, white chocolate it's typically white chocolate doesn't. doesn't, doesn't no, do... it's cocoa butter. Yeah, okay. But ours has less sugar in it because we are, our mantra's more cocoa, less sugar. Mm -hmm. So we always have cocoa as our number one ingredient. Right. Obviously, we can't with white chocolate. Yeah. But we have more cocoa butter and less I need sugar to try. I know, I've never had your white chocolate and I love white, white chocolate. Chocolates. It can be quite sickly though. Yeah. Yeah. I do, yeah, it's too sweet for me normally. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I do like our white chocolate. Okay. Brilliant. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank that you. was great. Thank you. Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Marcel, all good? That was great. That was nice, yeah, good. No, it was, it was really good. Always I love a chin wag. Gonna, I think my wife's gonna love that episode. She is. She's like, I told you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs>